So um, I'm, I'm not going to speak in, in any significant way to this slide. I, I have a background. You know, I've been doing this for a while. I've seen the effect for, a, for a, a, a large number of times, worked with many or most of you, actually. Um, it's very clear to me that there is a phenomenon, a phenomena, maybe a series of phenomena to be, to be studied and understood that uh, nuclear process occur, processes occur in lattices by means and at rates and with products differently from those reactions in free space. Um, we've convinced ourselves, I think everybody in this room is convinced of that fact, we have been spectacularly unsuccessful at convincing anybody that isn't in this room. Um, in terms of the effects that we've seen, there are many. I've ranked my confidence in the previous statement uh, according to these observations, and it may surprise some of you that my, my greatest level of confidence is in the production of tritium. I think that the evidence for the creation of tritium and accompanied uh, helium-3 is uh, unshakable. You know, experiments that I've done in my own laboratory, I can find no possible basis for rejection of those arguments. Of course, tritium isn't commensurate with the heat. And it's not even particularly useful, but it's nevertheless, in my view, an absolute, absolutely convincible, con convincing and, and unshakable of argument that low energy nuclear reactions occur. Um, second, I rank the production of excess heat, basically the fleischmann pons initial claim. Um, it's, I, I would put this at the 99.7% confidence level. Um, helium-4 a little lower, I think it's very important to the observations that Mel Miles and many others have made. Problem with helium-4, as you all know, is it's 5.22 parts per million in the air that we're breathing right now, and very few experiments have produced more than that. So the argument always exists that the helium that you measure got into your experiment uh, adventitiously and was not, in fact, produced by the reaction. There's a whole range of other reactions. Each of you will have your own uh, favorites. I feel like I brought you here a little bit under false pretenses. Anybody who believes that I have the answer and I'm going to tell you, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't have the answer. I don't have a clear answer myself. Um, what I want to do is guide us to a place that will allow uh, the con convincing of people that are not already convinced. How do we do that? And, and sad to say, even retired, if I had the secret, I very probably wouldn't be allowed to tell you. It would have been paid for by others or would have been the results of uh, information given to me by others under non-disclosure. So and it's this very problem of secrecy, I think, that is keeping us from achieving a final goal. I think in, a, uh, in the slide that I sent to, uh, slides that I sent to Sendai, I said that together we have the, the answer uh, collectively, individually, none of us do. And really the way to approach the answer, the understanding is full and free communication. We could even do that in the framework of science, but many, many barriers exist to that um, information sharing. Uh, at one limit, the greed of the sponsors, at the other limit, the ego of the researchers. So the, these are semi-intractable problems that we must fix. Um, I'm not going to go through this. I've, at the group at SRI has done a number of things. I've got 10 of them listed on this slide and the next. Uh, suffice to say that we have a little uh, credibility and have made contributions. The last most recent uh, adventure, I think, is the exploding uh, wire studies, the, mo the most recent thing that we've uh, published, anyway. <coughs> a lot of talk about theory today. It was an interesting way to introduce this, and there'll be more talk about uh, theory this afternoon. And there's some um, general belief that theory will somehow save us. I don't think that we can hope for that not without better experimental 
understanding. And in any case, it's not the normal path. It's not the normal path of invention. And most things that we work with today were engineered into existence. Uh, the science was backfilled, and the theory came along afterwards. And theory is ephemeral. It comes and it goes. A theory is a guide. That the, uh, uh, Dave had two reasons to do theory. One is to explain the past, and the other is to guide experiment. Uh, there is only one reason to do an, ex do an experiment. It's to test a hypothesis. Um, the th hypothesis obviously comes out of uh, theory, but I would love it if my theory friends could come up to me and say, do this, do that, you should see this, and you should see that. And some of my theory friends have done that. Um, sometimes it's helped, but by no means uh, always. Uh, a lot of our thinking has been subverted by the concepts of hot fusion. We allowed the debates to, to, to um, stray into the realms and, and language of hot fusion. That was a terrible mistake. Um, the very early days, the claim that if you've got fusion, you must have neutrons, you must have tritons. If you don't have tritons, you've got helium-4, you must have a, a high-energy gamma ray. A simply garbage argument. There is no reason for us to have enlisted the arguments of uh, hot fusion. I think one of two things must be done in order to make a proof, a more general proof to the, to the community as a whole. We need an unmistakable and irrefutable scientific evidence that nuclear effects take place in condensed matter. And this is the, really the statement. Martin never made it. And when we changed the language from cold fusion to LENR to condensed matter nuclear science, the CMNS acronym actually uh, indicated a transformation, a broadening of the field. When Stam and Martin discovered something that was much bigger than they understood. If the processes of nuclear physics take place in condensed matter differently than they do in free space, that's huge. It opens up enormous opportunities, but we have to prove it. Where do we go to to find a, a publication? How do we prove that? The other thing that I think we, we need to do, in fact, I assert that we must do, is we have to make a demonstration that this uh, effect is Practical. You say, well, why don't the guys who proclaim the existence of the Higgs boson, for example, have to show that you can use it to do work, to create energy? Well, they, they don't. Uh, we do. It's not fair, but that is a reality. Why is the problem so hard? Why is the bar set so high? Well, we, we have scientific proof, and I argued that tritium is scientifically proven, and yet it hasn't really changed the argument. If anything, the, 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 the community of people who work on this and understand it has shrunk over the years, not grown, and the earlier conferences had very large numbers of people. It partly it's our fault. Excuse me. Our approach to replication has been poor. In fact, uh, I would say abysmal. Only one person really ever attempted to do a strict engineering replication of anybody else's experiment, Georges Longchamp, with help from Jean-Paul Barbarian. The rest of us, when given an opportunity to make a replication, couldn't resist the temptation to improve it before we even began. And I'm as guilty of this as any. But we have, uh, it's really quite, as I say here, astonishing that the replication of attempts have been uh, as few and uh, methodolo methodologically poor as they have been. We, if we're going to replicate, we're going to have to be a lot more rigorous, a lot more focused on what it is we're trying to do. And our public publication record is not that good. And if people ask for a paper that proves the existence of cold fusion, there are, I don't know, what, a half a dozen, maybe a dozen papers that you can 
give to them that are sufficiently self-contained and well-explained to make a convincing proof of the existence of any of these phenomena. So, you know, I don't, I don't want to beat you guys up, but I'm beating me as well. Um, we haven't done as good a job as we have. I, here I'll give a little plug to, uh, to Jean-Paul Jean again. Two, two plugs in two slides. The existence of our journal and its steadily improving character has, uh, has made this argument a little less harsh. Our publication record is getting better and there's a place that you can go to to find um, the publications. Still too few, still too poorly described, still too scattered, and uh, in many cases not convincing. We need help. We can't do it. We need normal scientists in normal scientific institutions to, to throng to the field and, and um, work on the sort of sub-problems that will allow us to put this whole thing together and make a uh, systematic sense of it. Oddly enough, there's a well, missing generation problem. My, my argument is that in physical sciences, at least, which is the field that I've always worked in, Scientists do their best work from, say, 40 to 60. Before the age of 40, you don't have enough experience. Your intuition isn't sufficiently well honed to be able to, to uh, formulate good experiments, lead groups. By the time you get to 60, I can speak to this personally, you're getting a little tired. Your, your imagination is nowhere near as good as it was. You're not as open to new ideas. You become a little rigid in your thinking. So when cold fusion happened, March 23rd, 1989, I was 40 years old, and I'd actually already been working on the deuterium-palladium system for a decade at that point. Martin Fleischmann was 62. So we sort of bracketed, and, the, and pretty much all of the people that made conspicuous contributions in the, in, in the early 90s were in that age group. There are essentially none now. Um, our last speaker actually might fall well into that category, so I count one, but there are very, very few of the people in the sweet spot of um, applied research. We need to get those people back. Interestingly, John Huizenga said something intelligent and correct. Uh, it is seldom, if ever, true that it is advantageous in science to move into a new discipline without a thorough foundation in the basis of that field. Of course, he meant it as an insult. He intended it to mean that we, physical scientists, shouldn't have moved into the field of uh, nuclear physics and high energy physics without a thorough understanding of it. What John failed to understand was the discipline of fleischmann pons heat effect is physical electrochemistry, the tool to measure the observations that Martin was proclaiming a calorimetry, it was John who had an in, uh, a poor uh, understanding of the discipline that was relevant, not us. But we, we, we lay down and accepted that as a, as a legitimate criticism. It never was. Um, Charles Baudet pointed this out at great length in his book. So what do we do? What do we need to do? to bring the right disciplines, skill sets to bear on the problem. Uh, who do we engage to fund this? Right, I'm going to propose a strategy. The talisman that we need to create for the purpose of compelling, compelling conviction must work on two levels must be sufficiently simple and obvious that no hidden error can possibly exist to negate the results. So we have to do something simple, some easily explained. And the people that are going to make the decisions are probably going to be intelligent, or at least cunning. They are, um, can be relied on, at least in parts, to be open-minded. They will not be experts. They'll go to a um, armchair physicist and, 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 uh, uh, and request uh, scientific opinion 
the armchair physic physicist will rise up out of his desk and say, it can't work. It's much easier to say no than to say yes. There's no risk in saying no. Saying no is uh, the conventional answer and, and, and um, uh, implies no reputation risk if wrong. If you say it is true, uh, the, the uh, investor puts a lot of money into it, it turns out not to be true, he's likely to be unimpressed with, <laughs> with having been uh, vectored in a, in a non-productive direction. So we have to be able to pass that first round of scientific due diligence that, that the, the important person, be he a politician or a funder, has got to be able to see for himself that the arguments made against the object are, are not physically true. It, the thing got so hot or it did something useful. It, it, we cannot rely on ab, uh, abstruse scientific arguments or extended mathematics or any mathematics actually. The gays guys are not going to get it. The energy produced must be sufficiently net positive that useful work can be made of it. It's not only necessary to show that it's true, it's necessary to show that it's useful, potentially useful. We need something simple that makes power and therefore energy, preferably in electrical form that's easily measured and can be used to provide the conditions necessary for control and self-sustainment. People have talked about you know, self-sustainers for a very long time and they've been sort of, as a, in my role as a researcher, I had no special interest in self-sustainment. My now new role as an advocate, I very much recognize that if you had a device that could be put on a table that would power itself and do something else with the excess energy, that would make a convincing argument. It may not be useful, but it would make a convincing argument. The only, I, I put the slide together before I heard uh, George uh, Egerly's uh, talk on Monday. His talk depressed me because this has already been done half a dozen times and it, and it didn't do the job. So, but let's forget that, you know, we'll try again. A demonstration prototype. I, doesn't need to be practical, elegant, cheap, safe. Can be, can be ugly and cost a whole lot of money and hazardous. <laughs> we'll do things to mitigate the hazard. Uh, must be somewhat reliable. You know, the reviewers are going to come and if it only works one time in ten, they're likely to go away and say these don't, guys don't have it. But if it works five times in ten, you know, every second time it sort of does this, I think that's good enough. May have no more to do with the ultimate engineering practice, you know, the, 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 the thing that's going to be made to make use of this, except sharing an underlying uh, mechanism. So it can be a very impractical object. The purpose is to demonstrate that the effect is real and of sufficient scale potential to contribute to a solution to man's coming energy deficit. This is a real problem. And, and most people understand that this is a real problem. If hot fusion, bless its little heart, doesn't succeed, then um, we're going to run out of fissionable materials and, and the various accidents that have occurred in the world relating to fission already has promoted a very significant distaste for fission in the, in, in the populace as a whole. And the en engineers will take our demonstration prototype, they'll take it back to their own uh, institutions, they'll uh, use it to, to understand the parametric uh, variables, what, in, what is needed to scale it up, how do you control it, how long does it last, explore the parameters of control and uh, scale up. <coughs> so, what are the candidates? What technology, what size, what performance characteristics? Our object is to make this as easy as possible for ourselves. Each one of you is going to have a personal choice based upon your personal experiences as to what the uh, basis for this is going to be gas, 
electrochemistry, whatever, uh, uh, I'm going to give you a list of things that I think might be interesting to look at, but each one of you will have your own idea as to how to approach this demonstration prototype, assuming that you accept my argument. I'm just going to describe the terrain, see if we can get, uh, agree on a common language. How would we approach this uh, demonstration prototype? I'm going to discuss three systems that I have personal experience with. You know, the standard Fleischmann ponds, electrochemical, palladium deuteride, lithium, or palladium deuteride, lithium deuteroxide systems. All of these must operate at elevated temperatures for reasons that will be quite obvious soon. Various metal gas systems, the metals, be it palladium or nickel or alloys thereof, the the work being done in Japan now is, provides fairly convincing evidence that binaries work, ternaries perhaps uh, better, but there's a, there's a lot of things in this spectrum and I know probably least about this, and there's a sort of a hybrid that I want to talk about. Uh, metal gas, plasmas, all at elevated temperatures, and I'll give you a little example of that. For the uh, classic Fleischmann Pons approach, progenitors obviously Fleischmann and Pons. I mentioned Longchamp and Bavarian who replicated that experiment at elevated temperatures and made some um, very, very wise statements about the conditions under which this uh, effect occurs. And the dyadic um, energetics superwave stimulus. The best example that I'm aware of, Dave talked about a, a gain of 800, I, I'll ask him later what, what it is, but the best example that I'm aware of of the electrochemical system working is Energetics ETI-64. And about 30 watts of thermal output for an input of about 1 watt. Integrated energy of 1.14 megajoules for an integrated input uh, energy of 40 kilojoules. So a gain of 25 odd 27.5, so it boils the coolant water twice actually. So operating temperature 100 degrees or above. Um, the only real weakness of this system is it was never fully replicated and a huge amount of effort was put into the replication. Uh, it was replicated somewhat, it self-replicated in that it did this twice. But um, a lot of tears were shed over the inability to replicate easily this experiment because it would have solved our problem, I think, at least in terms of the demonstration prototype. Many of you know more about this than I do. Uh, you know, small dimension metals, gases, high temperature, um, there's Rossi and others um, with, with huge claims. I and mean, I mean if, if, if you believe the um, description of the Rossi experiments by Mats uh, Levan, um, he generated, Rossi generated hundreds of kilowatts with the instrument unplugged from the wall. So um, I have no reason to doubt Mats. He was there, he saw it, he's a smart guy, and I think he's an honest guy. So, so that, that'd do it, you know, if you can get a few hundred kilowatts for no electricity cost, that'd solve my problem, you know, that's, that would be a demonstration prototype, should it be that it could be done uh, more or less on demand. Um, the experiment that fascinated me at Peter's conference in, 19, in 2003, ICCF 10, uh, the, the first time I'd heard anything presented by the energetics group who were doing their experiments in uh, Israel, or the, the company was incorporated in New Jersey in the United States. But Eric presented a glow discharge experiment. Um, glow discharge incorporates what I think are the advantages of the gas system a low inventory of reactant and therefore low corrosivity and, 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 a, and a decreased potential to 
uh, degrade in performance with time, and the power of electrochemistry, which is the ability to achieve high chemical potential and high fluxes, both of which I assert are important to produce the effect. Eric showed a superwave modulated glow discharge, thoriated tungsten, thin palladium coating. That turned out to be one of the problems in that thin palladium coating spalled off after a relatively short period of time. But nevertheless, power gain of 3.88, energy gain of 6.72 because the thing had persistent heat, heat after death. So uh, one could easily conceive a demonstration prototype based on that machine, and it was a beautiful calorimeter. There's really no reason to doubt the numbers uh, presented here. But again, this one hasn't been replicated to any extent, as far as I'm aware. Here is uh, four systems. ETI 64, I probably presented this a particular slide a dozen times. This is the glow discharge experiment. Here is the input power. Here is the output power. You can see the tail. A clear uh, and obvious demonstration. A problem with heat after death, by the way, is that you can't control it. That is not optimal in an instrument that you're using to produce electricity or motive power. If your car doesn't stop when you take your foot off the accelerator, that's probably not ideal. These are two of SRI's best experiments. Uh, in, in, in a slide or two, you'll see how pathetic these were, but I thought they were brilliant at the time. The uh, statistics are you can't even see the error bars on this. This is a 90 sigma observation of excess heat, 90 times the uh, cal uh, calibrated accuracy of the calorimeter. Very clear effect. Um, at about 60, 65 degrees. This is the biggest gain we ever saw in an SRI experiment, gain of, you can't see it perhaps, but this is 300% here, so we have numbers at 600%, but sort of steady at like 270%. We had high gain, this is a boron system, by the way, for uh, Steve Kutinsky. This is palladium uh, with boron in the electrolyte, so a palladium boron surface. So, size. On what scale do we need to operate to convince our selected audience? And, and the target audience, it's very important to know who it is you want to talk to. What would it take you or somebody, you to convince somebody else that uh, the device that they're looking at is converting nuclear energy to thermal or electrical? It's, if this person knew nothing about cold fusion, LENR, CMNS, you, I mean, you must assume they haven't been to any of our conferences, they haven't read it or understood any of our uh, papers. The experiment must be observable. You must observe and integrate for long enough to uh, avoid the anxiety that you've stored secretly, surreptitiously, surreptitiously some energy source within it. So. It's, it's going to have to run more or less stably under observation for periods of time sufficient to uh, be sure that no chemical energy source could, or electrical energy source could be, could be causing this effect. What we've done so far is just not compelled acceptance of the fleischmann palms heat effect. We, we, we talk to ourselves we have a mindset, we have a knowledge base, we have a, uh, a, a, a conviction that is absolutely not shared in the broader community. We've observed very few energetic uh, nuclear products, which is a good thing. Under normal circumstances, this would be a good thing, but it's very hard to prove a nuclear effect without uh, nuclear products. And energetic products are a whole lot easier to prove than ground state ash. Calorimetry is an ancient tool. Little taught, little used, little understood, and, and, and disrespected, and it's considered by some to be intrinsically inaccurate. This, of course, is rubbish. The whole uh, world, science, 
of chemical thermodynamics is based upon calorimetry and much of what we do today in chemical engineering, much of our understanding of chemistry wouldn't exist if it weren't for calorimetry, but this was done a hundred years ago. Uh, heat's ephemeral, you know, it's not there, it's not there. It, it leaves little evidence behind, you sometimes get some melting or phase change, but that's a very sophisticated argument to make to somebody. What does it take to melt and what does it take to, to induce phase changes? Very, very few people would, would know that that had proved the heat density that you're claiming. And you basically need to trust your instruments and understand the numbers and most of the people that we will need to communicate with won't understand the instruments and, and, and don't want to be bothered with the numbers. The effect is also often small in inverted commas here, relative to the input power and the electrical input. In al almost all of the work that I did at SRI, with the exception of the one slide that I put up there, P19, our gains were, you know, 1.1 to 1.3. You know, three, a gain of three is, 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 is huge, and we very, very rarely saw it, and we did hundreds of experiments. It's also small in absolute terms, mostly, and I talked about Rossi's hundreds of kilojoules. That's not small in an absolute sense. Most of our experiments run at watts. Ed, in his first book, reviewed 242 experiments, successful heat-producing experiments in the world from 1989 to 2006. 123 of them are electrochemical. This is Ed's, and I've overlaid uh, a graphic. So these, this is the count for a particular box. This is so 0 to 1.25, 1.25 to 2.5, and so on. So in the, in the regime less than 1.25 watts of heat production, 117 experiments. You know, half of the experiments produce less than uh, 1.25 watts. The, uh, and the tail is sort of exponential. It's interesting. It's interesting. This is the, the, the totality of the data set, all experiments. The blue is the electrochemical experiments, both exponential, both with the same um, time constant. Um, 2.6, so, so 2, 2.6 watts, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the watt constant, if you like, of this uh, curves 2.6. If you look at the uh, zone, so 10, might, 10 watts, you might say, is interesting. In the regime, 10 plus or minus one and a quarter watts, 16 experiments total, nine of them electrochemical. Greater than 10 watts, there are 40 experiments. There's quite a lot of experiments in this tail, but um, only you know, in bits and pieces, ones and uh, twos. My argument is that one watt is too small. Nobody's going to believe it. And 100 watts is too hard. You know, up to 2007, nobody had, there was zero. So um, I'm going to argue that you probably should be thinking about a scale of 10 to 50 watts. We know it can be done. 100 watts would be better, but it isn't necessary. Hmm? So if we accept 10 to 40 watts as a modestly robust level, um, just it's even tactilely, you know, if, if, if the, the, the people that you need to convince would be convinced by touch, much more convincing than uh, numbers. And we need it to generate sufficient electricity to self-sustain. We need energy gain and elevated temperature to beat down the onerous constraints imposed by uh, Carnot. So if we look at Carnot, what does that mean? This is, uh, the blue line is the Carnot limitation, that the heat rejection temperature in this calculation is uh, 20 degrees C. As a function of temperature, Carnot efficiency increases, obviously. What I've uh, super plotted here is um, how much net electricity you would get if your experiment uh, had this amount of uh, uh, gain. So the top line is a gain of 20. So if you had 20, a gain of 20 at 200 degrees, 
you'd have uh, three watts left over from a 10 watt input. So um, I, I, we could do you could power a little light bulb or charge somebody's um, cell phone or whatever. But that's a gain of 20. But by the time you get down to gains of um, two, um, you know, even at 500 degrees, uh, you're, you're only getting a little bit more than a watt left over to do something useful with, and it's much, much harder to experiment at 500 than it is at uh, 200, for example. Here I've put some points. This is ETI 64, the, my, my star for performer, gain of uh, 27.5. Uh, output temperature greater than 100 degrees C. So had we had ETI 64 hooked up to a heat to electricity converter of some reasonable efficiency, and you'll ne never get to Kano. Kano is a limit, which means you can't do it. It's always worse than that. But um, you know, even if we only got half of that, we would have three watts left over from our 10 watt input. We could we could use that to make a demonstration. So we could have. We could have made our demonstration prototype already if we had have anticipated the need to do this. This is the glow discharge cell from Energetics sitting there with a gain of six. It's, it's a little unfair because the glow discharge obviously had a temperature greater than 100 degrees, but it was boiling water, that's all I know. And, and, and these SRI experiments that I'm so proud of uh, are under the line. You know, th th there, there, there's nothing that I could have ever done with any of them to make a demonstration uh, prototype and prove the point by this means. They were not intended to do that, of course. They were intended to understand, not demonstrate. Gain is the key. I'm just nearly at the end. Gain is the key. You need gain, and the key to gain is reducing the input power. It's much easier to manipulate the denominator than the numerator. Uh, and heat after death, death of course is the, is the pinnacle of that, where the denominator goes to zero. But um, here's, here's a bunch of SRI cells, it, low gain. Um, it, the, you know, this is the net electrical output as a percentage of the input power versus uh, gain. So down here you're, you're doomed, there, you have no hope. Uh, the glow discharge cell just rising above the line. ETI 64 is way to hell up here. It's, um, we get, you know, 50% of our electric, well, 500% of our, of our input power. We, we, we can do some useful work if we have a system that performed as ETI 64 performed. This is the end. I've argued this for a long time, I still believe it. Loading, which is chemical potential, is important. Flux is critical. So we can load and constipate the surface in such a way that there is no more loading and therefore no flux, and there will be, I assert, no effect. Theory alone is not going to allow us to achieve our goal. It can help. We've got to prove that a novel nuclear effect is taking a place uh, taking place in uh, condensed matter and creating net energy. Then we've got to demonstrate it. We need the help of working scientists. We need this demonstration protocol. I said this before, but I'll restate it. High gain is crucial to accomplishing this goal, something I hadn't quite appreciated until I did these uh, calculations and thinking for this uh, talk. You, you affect the gain better by manipulating the denominator, so very, be very miserly in your input power. You produce the effect with as little power as possible and that will uh, advantage your pursuit of the demonstration prototype. Um, finally, uh, this is for my good friend Irv who's just published his book after writing it for 10 years. Irv Dardic is right. I mean, the, 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 the effect that we're looking at is a multi-resonant phenomenon multi-resonant in two dimensions. You need multiple frequencies. Every, everything in nature is oscillatory. You need to stimulate more than one of those modes by more than one of those means. So you need to stimulate it electrically, acoustically, magnetically, uh, uh, thermally, optically, all of the above, and you'll produce the effect. Thank you for your attention.